Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the CGC webinar series for this month. Uh, for today's talk, we have uh, Ms. Angela Page, who is the Director of Strategy and Engagement at the Global Alliance for Genomics and uh, Health Organization, also known as GA4GH and Dr. Michele Matt Mattioni, who is a senior program manager at um, Valsera, uh, known previously as Seven Bridges. Uh, the title of their talk today is Interoperability and Integration, uh, GA for GH Standards at Work on the CGC. In the first part of uh, the webinar, Ms. Page will introduce the GA for GH organization its products and how to get involved with both. And thereafter, Dr. Mattioni will showcase how the uh, Cancer Genomics Cloud has used the GA4GH standards to enable interoperability and connecting to other platforms. So with that, I would like to uh, pass it over to uh, Angela. Angela, if you want to start sharing. Sure. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, you're not sharing my, oh, I had it. How about now? Yes, you can see. All right, great, <laughs> great. Right, so thank you, um, Divya, for that introduction, and thank you to the organizers for in, uh, inviting us to, to give this talk today. I'm really excited. So like Divya said, I'm going to talk about sort of the why, what, and how of um, open genomic standards development as it takes place in ga for gh And um, I put my email there. If anybody has any questions from today's talk and wants to learn more, please do reach out. So like I said, I'm gonna talk about why J4GH exists, how we work, what we've achieved so far and how you can get involved. So as I'm sure everybody here is quite familiar, the first draft of the human genome was released 20 years ago. And it was, I think it took like 13 years, thousands of researchers and nearly $3 billion to complete. 10 years later, the cost of a single genome had gone down to roughly $10,000. And this meant that the sort of field was starting to see a kind of tidal wave of genomic data heading its way. And so GA4GH was founded in 2014 as sort of the, the, the hopeful solution to kind of managing all of this data, making sure that it is interoperable um, and can be um, shared responsibly, et cetera. So, um, so I want to say that everything that GA4GH does is sort of founded on like, you know, so the, the, the history of the genomics effort, like those thousand research, thousands of researchers that I mentioned from its very beginning, genomics has been a really collaborative effort. And that really is at sort of the heart of GA4GH. And one of the unique things about how GA4GH was founded is it kind of found our regulatory and ethics community identified this sort of uh, nascent human right in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which said that all humans have the right to share in scientific advancement and its benefits, as well as the right to be recognized for their work. So with this, quote, tidal wave of genomic data, our founders sort of said, if we don't make this data available for secondary research, um, we won't re be fulfilling that human right to, to truly and um, comprehensively benefit from the, the science. Um, so since then, um, you know, many, many genomic data initiatives have popped up around the globe. We kind of try to maintain a landscape analysis, um, which says roughly more than 200 genomic data initiatives are present around the globe, whether they are in clinical genomic medicine, research programs, national genomic strategies, or population scale cohorts. Um, it's hard to, to tell exactly how many genomes back in 2017 we did a kind of rough back of the envelope um, assessment of how many genomes we thought would be available for research by 2022. The number was 6 million, 60 million. It's a very difficult number to validate, but the point is, well, six, uh, genomes from 60 million individuals, which means many, many more sequences than that. Um, I'm sorry, forget that. Um, the, uh, the point is that there are many, many genomes available just as the founders sort of um, recognized, but unless we can join them up, um, bring them together and create sort of a virtual cohort by beca because of the fact that, you know, moving genomes out of their jurisdictional um, boundaries is, is not always possible, we need to um, create this, um, these mechanisms. So if we can do that, if we can share data responsibly, we stand to um, demonstrate um, 
patterns in health and disease, increased statistical significance of analyses, which can lead to stronger variant interpretations, increase accurate, more accurate, the number of accurate diagnoses that we are delivering to patients and ultimately advance precision medicine. So yes, that is the opportunity that with which, which that we are facing. So there are many different approaches to data sharing from the very sort of traditional centralized genomic database or knowledge base, whether we're depositing data into a central location, whether it's data or learning about like, you know, um, variant interpretation data or if it's the actual sequencing data. Um, but the challenge there, like I sort of alluded to earlier, is that, um, you know, it's difficult, it can be difficult to move data from one country to another and who decides where that centralized location should exist. So over time, we've sort of, as technology has sort of started to allow, we've moved into this more hub and spoke federation model where, um, a, you know, a pre sort of determined group of members agree on a set of common data elements, structures, and access and usage rules. And any member of that community is sort of by definition allowed to sort of share the data within that network. Um, but another um, sort of shift that we're starting to see, not just from um, seeing more data coming out of the clinical community rather than historically having come almost exclusively out of the research community, we're also seeing a shift towards data being stored in the cloud. And I think in the next 10 years, we're expecting to see the, um, you know, the amount of data stored in the cloud to outpace that what's stored on the, on the web, or sorry, on-prem. And that just means that this sort of idea of linked, distributed, disparate data sets is really sort of the way of the future. Um, this is what GA for GH means when we say federation. Um, it's um, this idea of being able to move analysis to data, data visiting maybe perhaps rather than data sharing, where we don't aggregate data close to each researcher, but actually create mechanisms to move the analysis to the data and then return the results. And that's what Michele will be talking about, I think, in a little bit more detail later. Um, so, right, since the data are just so globally distributed, this, this just kind of reinforces the original mandate of GA4GH. We need interoperable standards to answer today's research questions. So GA4GH, like I said, was founded in 2014 with an aim to accelerate progress in genomic science and human health by developing standards and framing policy for responsible genomic and health-related data sharing. So we call ourselves the International um, Organization Standards Development Organization for Genomics, but we don't just develop standards. We also set policy, uh, or not, we don't set policy, but we develop, we develop policy frameworks and um, practices, guidelines. So how do we work? Um, this is just kind of a big picture view of thousand foot view of what the G4GH community consists of. We have over 500 organizational members distributed across 50 countries, um, roughly 4,000, actually probably more, closer to 5,000 individual subscribers who are people that have basically said, we want to sort of stay in touch with you and, and know what GA4GH is doing. Um, about a 10th of those are actually actively participating on the GA4GH work streams of which we have eight, and I will get into that in a second. Um, some of them are members of our driver projects, but certainly not all of them. And together, this community has released 30, over 30 technical standards now um, and over 20 regulatory policies and frameworks. And we are currently aware of more than 150 implementations and deployments of our technical standards, which is really exciting for us. Um, so like I said, we are um, a, a collection of eight work streams and we have 24 driver projects. So this is G4GH kind of works in a matrix model where um, we have these eight work streams and then different um, initiatives populate those work streams. So there's so so the G4GH staff is about 20 people. We're distributed across um, four host institutions in the US, the UK, and Canada, but the actual sort of community, the GA4GH community that actually is developing the standards is much, much, much larger than that. That's that 450 individuals that I mentioned earlier. Um, and they come from all sorts of different places. So, um, so as you see here, we have about six, we have six technical work streams, each of which is devoted to solving challenges in a specific sort of area of data sharing, whether it's discovering data, um, figuring out how to do data, uh, genomic data in the cloud, um, figuring out how to connect clinical and phenotypic or uh, genetic and phenotypic data together and then exchanging that. Um, and all of this is building on a foundation of the regulatory and ethics and data security. So those two foundational work streams 
sort of check everything that comes out of the, the blue rows as well as creates its own guidelines and um, standards for use by the broader community. And so, right, so then the driver projects are, tw are uh, 24 different initiatives that have committed to um, participating in the GA for GH work streams. Um, and I wanted to make the point that if you are a member of C or if you're a part of CGC, then you are already by definition a part of GA for GH um, and part of our sort of core heart, the heart of GA for GH is um, the Cancer Research Data Commons is um, an important GA for GH driver project. Um, so, so, so that's sort of how that's like the structure of GA for GH, and and each of the different work streams is focused on, um, you know, creating a set of standards. And I'm going to go into those in a little bit more detail. But I just wanted to outline to the sort of three strategic areas that we have um, uh, really set as our kind of mandate for the for the since 2020 for the next several years, and these are interoperability and alignment which means not just um, interoperability of sort of the, the broad genomics community, but interoperability of GA4GH standards with one another so that you can sort of create this um, uh, sort of internet of genomics or some, you know, like a, a very kind of full service platform. If you develop according to GA4GH standards, we've kind of got it all along there. Um, as well as interoperability and alignment with standards coming out of other um, genome, uh, other standards development organizations, whether it's ISO, HL7, we have sort of strategic collaborations with those groups. The second priority for us is implementation support. So um, we, I will talk a little bit more about this, but we have done a um, gap analysis every two years and continually just say, hearing the need for GA4GH to, to not just produce the standards, but also to produce all of the, the resources that go along with them to make it easy for individuals to take, take them up. Um, and then finally, finally engaging with healthcare and clinical standards is, you know, as I have been sort of saying along the way, like if the goal is to, you know, get the data from healthcare, perform secondary analysis on it and then use that to inform human health and medicine going forward. We really, that really requires um, good engagement with the healthcare and clinical standard or clinical community. And, you know, um, historically GA for GH has come out of the research space because that's where genomics has come. And that's really where majority of our community is based. And so this is still a challenge for us, but it's a, it's a very, very key priority. Um, so now I'm gonna go a little bit into what GA for GH has, has accomplished so far. Um, we, we lovingly call this the uh, GA for GH circle of life diagram. It's really supposed to demonstrate or sort of showcase the sort of learning health system where you're starting with patient or participant data, which then can go into research, um, the learnings from which can ultimately go around and inform human health for future patients. And the point here is that um, GA for GH standards really have been standards and policies, we should call them GA for GH products, are um, present at each sort of step of this life cycle. So um, I'm going to go into a few of them. Everywhere you see a, um, a logo, a GA for GH logo, that's a, that's a GA for GH standard. So they're really kind of, there's a lot here. Um, I obviously can't talk in great detail about any of them for, <laughs> for too long. So I'm just going to kind of flash through a few, starting with um, the file formats that you are probably all very, very familiar with. And these actually predate GA for GH. They were developed by, um, I think in some cases, the Thousand Genomes Project. And um, But regardless, the, the people that developed these file formats sort of became the people that are a part of GA for GH today. Um, and so uh, uh, you're familiar with these file formats. They are now part of GA for GH. They are maintained by GA for GH. Um, and I just kind of wanted to put that out there that if you are using those, you are using GA for GH standards. Um, next up, I want, you know, I made the point that there are um, other sort of non-technical um, products coming out of GA for GH, and those include um, a series of policies, uh, sort of policy frameworks that uh, if you're sort of starting up a new data sharing initiative or any genomic data initiative, really, you can sort of take off the shelf and, and reuse verbatim or adapt for your specific context, but it kind of provides a substrate upon which you can build your policies. Um, likewise, the GA for GH Consent Toolkit is a series of documents to help draft clear informative con consent forms. And this is actually like just a whole series of consent clauses that you can just kind of lift out as, you know, cherry pick the ones that are relevant to your, um, to your project and pop into your own consent form. 
Um, so now when we sort of move into the area of the data custodian, um, we have produced something called the data security infrastructure policy. And this is just a series of recommendations for the technology and infrastructure that our um, data security work stream recommends um, for genomic and health related data sharing. So if you are planning to you know, host data lo locally, these are the things that we think you should em employ to make sure that you are following best practice. Um, next up, moving into sort of the data access space. Um, GA for GH passports is a very exciting new standard, um, which just as it sort of sounds, works like a, a, a regular travel passport. Um, you, you know, it, it follows the researcher around and tracks kind of where you've been and what you've been granted access to. So the really cool thing here is that, um, you know, if different, just like with real, um, real passports and countries sort of recognizing different visas from different countries if if you have applied for for data access for access to data at one institution and a different institution actually recognizes the decision of that first institution then you don't have as much of a burden when you apply for access the second time um, and this is linked to the data use ontology which is sort of the data custodian side of it where um, they will tag their data sets with different use use uh, use restriction terms um, so that when you know you come in with your passport as the researcher and you say I am a cancer researcher um, in you know at the such and such university um, but this data set has or maybe I'm a cancer researcher at a pharmaceutical company but this data set has been tagged with the duo terms that are only suggest it's, um, you know, it's only been consented to be used for academic research. So then sort of through these um, computational standards, you can sort of automatically determine whether or not you sh will be granted access. So this reduces the burden for data access committees. It doesn't eliminate the need for a data access committee at all because it, they still need to um, review it all, um, but it will sort of, you know, weed out some of the obvious um, no-goes. It also, like I said earlier, reduces the burden for the researcher because, you know, to the extent that it reduces the number of data access requests that you have to um, submit, whether it's to the same institution and to a different institution that recognizes your visas. Uh, next up um, into the discovery um, uh, standards. So we have standards for discovering services that you can use to analyze genomic data, as well as services or uh, uh, standards to discover actual data. So this, um, the Beacon API is actually like probably, maybe it's, probably, it's maybe the first like truly GA for GH standalone standard um, versus the file formats, which sort of, you know, predated us. Um, this was, it started as a, just a kind of bare bones um, mechanism for dis determining whether or not there was actually an appetite for sharing data within the genomics community. And all it said in its very first form, which was released, I think, in 2014, was, um, you know, does this data set contain this variant, yes or no? And then your query would be met with a very simple yes or no. Um, and so that was it. And so it just kind of, you know, different institutions that that implemented the beacon and the number of people that were sort of querying the different beacons kind of started to show whether or not there was this appetite. And of course there was. Um, so since then, um, just last year, Beacon version two was released, which is a much more sort of complex, nuanced API that allows not just for that simple query, but also for more, more complex queries. And, and it also, um, it's not just, uh, just simple, simply does the variant exist, but also like what other sorts of data do you have? Um, and, um, it, you know, and if you actually kind of link it up with your passport in my, you know, all of these things kind of interoperability, all of these things are intended to work together so that it could sort of deliver this sort of one stop shop kind of platform that I was describing earlier. Um, then the just a couple of uh, more that are focused on um, sort of harmonizing the data themselves. The variation representation standard is um, basically giving sort of guidelines for how we will talk about variation and, you know, so that we all sort of do it in similar ways. And of course, there are many, many standards already out there sort of deciding how we should do this. And the variation representation standard is actually more of a framework for um, kind of con con uh, bringing those all together and without having to um, uh, reproduce the, the um, the structure depending on which uh, setting you're looking at. 
And then um, the pheno packets, as I said earlier, the Clin Pheno Workstream is working on this one, which is um, really provides a machine readable mechanism, also human readable, but a machine readable mechanism for sharing clinical and phenotypic data and linking that to the genomic data. And then finally, I'm not going to go into these, but I just want to point out these are the four um, GA for GH cloud APIs, which all work together um, to allow researchers to um, discover data, retrieve data, um, find and, and retrieve tools to analyze the data, and then actually run the analyses all in the cloud. And that's what Michele will talk about next. So um, implementation support, as I said earlier, this is a huge priority for GA for GH. Um, we have sort of three resources at the moment, and we are actively building out our staff technical team. I actually had um, a couple of interviews today. We are adding more developers to the team to, to create more of these kinds of resources because we know that this is an important um, critical aspect of getting the standards out into real world use. So the ga for gh starter kit is basically a series of kind of off the shelf implementations of ga for gh standards that you can just sort of take and implement in your own local context and sort of play with it, see how it works. It's not very um, uh, nuanced, it's not very smart, but you know it gives you, it, it provides us an on ramp to ga for gh um, standards use. Client scripts um, are available on GitHub, which provide sort of demonstration um, Python code for client uh, for, to show how clients can connect with existing GA for GH implementations. And then finally, also on GitHub, a series of step-by-step -step guides for actually using GA for GH APIs in the real world, both from the client's perspective as well as the um, the server perspective. Finally, and this is where I am most comfortable, how to get in involved with GA for GH. Um, like I said earlier, we have this um, matrix sort of model. Um, this is how we've worked since 2017. But since then, we really have expanded a lot. And we're trying to, um, to, to do a better job of communicating really the many different ways that, that people can get involved in the, the, the broad diversity of the genomics or of the GA4GH community, because it's not just driver projects. Like I said earlier, you do not have to be a member of a driver project to be involved in GA4GH, to join the work streams, to do any of the various activities that I'll describe in a second. Um, you might just be an individual contributor, might be a you know a citizen scientist who's kind of interested in this stuff. You are welcome to come. Um, and so these, so and and likewise, the work streams are not the only activity which is underway within GA4GH. Um, sort of focusing first on these bottom dark blue um, rows, uh, the way this sort of GA4GH kind of uh, advances standards development is through these sort of three steps. First is sort of ideation study groups. Um, do it performing sort of landscape analysis and assessing needs. Is there really a need for a new standard here? Um, and if the answer is yes, it'll move into a work stream where it'll be developed and aligned with the existing standards. And then finally, once the sort of first version of that has been released, um, we start to deploy it within the GA4GH implementation form, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And then up above that, these are just two kinds of, um, inf well, not, uh, so the National Initiatives Forum is a, is a formal collective body of national genomic data um, uh, initiative, uh, uh, government funded genomic data initiative strategies that are focused on getting genomics into healthcare. So whether it's Genomics England, um, the All of Us Research Program, these sort of large scale initiatives. And then the communities of interest are sort of domain specific areas where we bring together um, researchers, clinicians, the whole sort of gamut to come together to say like, what are the challenges in our specific disease area? What are the opportunities? How could we use GA4GH standards to advance our practice? Um, and so I just wanted to highlight the cancer community. I know Divya said earlier that actually this forum might in, in, uh, invite many researchers beyond just cancer. And so obviously anyone is invited to any of these, but I just wanted to highlight the cancer community. Um, and really it's kind of a great time to get involved with that because we're these are all kind of new and we're just starting to get our footing and starting to say, what really is the need here from an interoperability perspective? What does the cancer community really need? Um, and then feeding that into GA for GH as we do, do those sort of landscape analysis and standards development. Um, sorry. And then uh, finally, the just talking about the implementation forum, a little bit more detail. These are um, use case specific interoperability projects which are focused on implementing GA for GH standards in a kind of end-to-end -end format across multiple groups so that you can show interoperability in the real world. 
Um, this started as the Federated Analysis Systems Project, which you may or may not have heard of, um, but essentially it's a way for GA4GH to um, welcome the community of implementers to pilot our standards, troubleshoot them, tell us what's working, what's not, and identify new needs along the way. Um, just getting off the ground, this is all very brand new. The, um, the two projects that are just starting are on federated imputation and federated variant matching. And if these are of interest to you, please do reach out. It's a great time to get involved there. Um, another opportunity that we have at the moment is um, an open call for new driver projects. As I said earlier, we have 24. They've been around with us since 2017. Most of those are going to stick around. A couple are going to step down and we're going to add a few more. If you are part of, initiative, of an initiative that you think sort of meets these criteria, please reach out, check out the application. Um, let me know if you have questions. We would love to hear from you. Um, and essentially that is that sort of formal commitment to standards development. So it's a little bit, it's a, it's a more, it's a heavier lift than just kind of joining a work stream. You're absolutely welcome to do that as well. Um, so yes, please do. Um, you can encourage your organization to become a member. You can sign up to our many newsletters, um, join our Slack space or uh, get involved in any of the work streams by emailing me or info at ga4gh.org. Um, I see that there is a hand raised, but I am not able to, hold on, how can I do that? Daniel, do you want to ask your question? Oh, sure, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I uh, had to step away for just a quick second, but I think I oh, heard it's... Odyssey being brought up. Um, oh, no, I, I did I not mention Odyssey. <laughs> You did not mention Odyssey. Okay, gotcha. I was just wondering if there was any uh, GA for GH um, uh, representation uh, within some of the genomics working groups. There are a, a number of them over there. Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a great question. We have done um, a couple of mappings with the different. There's so many out there. Um, yeah. Odyssey is definitely represented. I can't tell you like right off the top of my head in what ways or where, but it's it's in there. Um, and if you wanted to connect offline, we could we could figure that out for sure. Okay. Sounds yeah. good. Thanks so much. No problem. Um, yeah, so I think I just have. Sorry. So, sorry, I was just saying thank you so much for the talk. I was yes. also going to just say that um, all the questions, um, if we can take it at the end, just so that uh, we can stay on track with time, that would be really great. So, sure. And I only have, I think, one slide left, um, which is to oh, say- Oh, you, you still have yeah. one slide left. No, okay. no, 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 just, just one more. Just come <laughs> to San Francisco and hang out with us. And thank you to our, our, uh, our funders. And now it's over to you, Michele, and I will stop sharing screen eventually. Thank there you go. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. OK. Um, OK, so I'll um, get going. If I also manage, let me just get my screen share. Okay. There you go. <clears throat> okay. I hope you can see my screen. And uh, if all is good, we can get going. Looks good. All right. Awesome. So, uh, yeah. So, <clears throat> I'm uh, gonna uh, I'm gonna talk on, uh, about the interoperability and integration GHH uh, standards that work on the CGC. This is a mouthful that we choose. So, you know, a lot of people were gonna <laughs> join in the 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 webinar. Uh, in particular, like uh, I will uh, focus on uh, on those. So my name is Michele Mattioni. I work uh, at uh, Belsera, which is like uh, formerly it was uh, um, Seven Bridges, now part of Belsera. And um, yeah, that's my email address in case you want to uh, write or you have like uh, or reach out. So I'm gonna try to focus a little bit on DERS, Try to explain what is DERS why has been built by the gh for gh uh, community and uh, what is time what try what is the job that is trying to accomplish so um there's basically is trying uh, is providing a unifying approach to connect with the object on the cloud uh, what does it mean it means that um as you know when you have like uh, files on the cloud you know, like different ways that you can approach them of course, uh, uh, there is more than one way that you can do it. 
but the main problem is like that usually with genomics files or genomics imaging or other type of files you need like a flexible way to also handle the authorization and at the same time you want like an identifier that is able to basically find this file on the cloud making sure that you have like the ability to access it with the a standardized way so um why this was uh, so difficult because you have a lot of stakeholders that are trying to basically solve this problem and everybody has like a different slightly different angle on what is the problem trying to solve so for example this uh, this graph here that was made like a long time ago was uh, uh try to basically um provide like a, a quick overview of what are the stakeholders so you have data consumers what the data consumers usually are researchers and the data they basically people that want to use the data to do science and to basically um do research on those data and uh, uh, try to achieve like uh, um yeah basically contribute uh, their uh, discoveries to the world at the same time you have the data producers they are like usually um, people that have like the sequencing, they might run biorepositories, they might have been part of the sequencing of this data, they might have like, uh, it's it's a very diverse type of uh, people that you have um, that are basically producing the data. At the same time, you have like the data controllers. What are the data controllers is basically stakeholders that are interested that in are used in the proper way, by the authorized people, there is no data breach. There is no a way to basically use the data in the not a consented way, which is extremely important. And uh, on top of that, you have also uh, the data access tools part. Basically, it's like different data, uh, di sorry, different software that wants to basically access this this data and do an operation there on behalf usually of the data consumers. So it's a really diverse. Uh, environment with a lot of different people there are trying to um, basically solve this problem. So uh, so here comes DERS. So DERS is an acronym for Data Repository Service. And uh, the uh, canonical definition of DERS is the following. Let me give me a second there. I tried to read it all of it. So it's like the, it, the data, the DERS basically API provides a generic interface to data repositories so data consumers, including workflow systems, can access data in a single standardized way regardless of where it's stored or how it's managed. The primary functionality of DERS is to map a logical ID to a means for physically retrieving the data represented by that ID. So here what you can see on this slide on the first block, uh, that one is basically an example of a DERS URI. So you have DERS at the very beginning, you have like columns slash slash like the domain of the server of the their servers and then you have like the id that is basically in this case just like a numeric id it doesn't need to be numeric it can be also with uh, um, if you want uh, other type of uh, for example letters and so forth there is in the documentation there is link below you have like the possibility to understand exactly what can go or what cannot go on uh, uh, their ids so that um, there's your rights gets translated to a maybe more familiar HTTPS type of uh, uh, URI that basically where you can basically do a GET request. From this GET request, you can basically then get like the first response from a other server. So um, the compact URI gets translated to the to this like uh, expanded uh, URI where you can basically um, get the, the data from. So what do you receive from a DERS uh, code? So here on, on, on the left, you have basically uh, the, the, the type of data that uh, you receive from a uh, DERS servers where you have basically the name of the file, you have the self URI that basically identify the same file itself and the same DERS IDs. And then you have two important things bits here that is inside this access methods list, which is like the uh, a type, a region, and then there is another bit that is called access ID, that it's what you need to do the following call on this, uh, uh, on this basically there's your eyes. So what is important about it is that the access methods is a list in the sense that there's your eye can have uh, more 
uh, one or more uh, basically location. They can be on different, uh, for example, commercial cloud. In this case, we have like a type as free. So this uh, file is specifically on AWS and the region is a US is one. So uh, why is important to know the region and to know the type? Because as Angela was basically um, uh, was uh, saying in the talk before, we would like to bring the computation towards the data because that reduces uh, both the eagles charges in case those are uh, needed from basically moving the data around, reduce the time because you don't have to download this like uh, heavy files. And almost, oh, and, and another important bit, like sometimes you cannot really move the data due to like uh, policies or like, you know, legal constraints. Therefore you have to basically operate where the data are available. One important thing is I want to um, showcase here is that um, the CGC team, uh, so Seven Bridges personnel, uh, has contributed to the PR that is written there. That was done like four years ago in 2019, March, I just look it up, where basically we propose to have like type and region available on the DERS response. So that was like uh, when uh, um, Angela was saying that this is like an open standard, everybody contributes, that's how it works. You basically create like a PR on the standards, it gets basically picked up by the communities, gets discussed, and then if a consensus is reached, it gets merged into the into the standard itself. <clears throat> we are like uh, extremely involved in this type of contribution, and we are extremely uh, also um, happy that uh, the data and the, the standard is really alive, so it really comes into into life. Pretty easily. Uh, right now, we reach uh, the version 1.3.0 of theirs. So now I would like to focus a little bit more on what happened on the CGC, how the standards are being used over there, and how that basically makes like their approach uh, on uh, on uh, on the cancer genomics cloud. So in uh, um, the CGC can act as a DERS server. So we, it was launched in 2019. It's one of the first DERS servers that was launched in the world. And basically it provides a, a way to interact across platform with the flexible authorization. And it's uh, we have like a documentation online. That link is live. You can basically go and check it out. Uh, and maybe to the trained eyes, you have seen that the response that I showed before was exactly from the documentation from the CGC. So basically you have like the ability to get this uh, data from the CGC into uh, you know other spaces where you have like the DERS servers. At the same time, the CGC can act uh, as its own DERS servers. And in this example, I'm showing how you can basically get different data uh, from two different uh, DERS servers. In this case, I'm talking, I'm picking as an example, the Cancer Genomics Cloud and Kavatica, uh, and you basically have the um, you have the possibility to uh, get these two day and uh, these two files directly into the CGC. So how does it look like? It's uh, um, let's see if it goes. Yes. So this is like a quick uh, overview on how it's done. So in this case, we wrote a little. Uh, um, Python API that was like, sorry, a Python routine that was basically retrieving the DERS uh, for us. On the first block, you have like the call to Kavatica, and on the second block, you have like the call to the CGC. What I wanted to basically uh, showcase is that on the first call, you have like the Kavatica DERS URL for um, where is basically the, the API, what is the root. You have the authentication token, which I will talk about in a second you have the DERS IDs. In the same way, you have like the same uh, type of call on the CGC. This is great because it provides you several benefits. Like one of the benefits is like you have like a standard way to basically get this data, even though they are like on two different, uh, um, on two different uh, uh, platforms. And at the same time, you have like a, a reusable, uh, reusable call that you can basically, um, uh, exactly as the name it is, you can reuse it 
across different platforms, which also means that people that want to use theirs, they have to run it once and they can use it for different type of uh, application, different type of platforms. Uh, this is great because usually you don't have like an enormous amount of resources to um, basically take care of uh, different API that changes all the time. You have a standard way to do it. There is a version, the, ver the, the standard is open and you have basically the possibility to write compliance test uh, for it. Um, so this was great from the point of view of uh, starting this conversation and having basically this as a landmark on uh, 2019. But we also didn't stop there because we wanted to have the possibility to uh, achieve three major things. One was to import their CRIs directly on the CGC. Second one, it was to do it with a, a, an easy to use UX that basically was accepting not only uh, basically Cavatica is in this example, but any type of their uh, server. And at the same time, we wanted to be able to use this data only at runtime. As you know, on the CGC, there is the possibility to run uh, workflows, and task and to also use this data in the data studios. So what it means, it means like we didn't want a user to upload this data on the CGC and then incur in a storage and all these kind of like different things, but we wanted to have like the pointer. So when the, 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 the user does not incur in any storage cost and most importantly, like all the authorization that is needed, it's still alive and um, ready to be used. Um, so we have um, uh, achieved this and we have done this uh, in uh, today. We have two different ways from a UX point of view that you can import this uh, URIs. Uh, so there is a way to just uh, pass the, the there's URIs directly into um, the, um, the text boxes that you can see here on the left. And at the same time, you can upload a manifest uh, file where you have like the there's your eyes uh, first column and basically then all the metadata you might want to, to import like for example sample id case ids diagnosis gender sex uh, and so forth um this is, is based on the ncpi manifest standard that we have like piloted in the cpi uh, basically <clears throat> uh collaboration and the it's like uh it's the the important part is like the there's your eyes column is the one that is mandatory all the others are like uh, uh nice to have if it's it's always uh, suggested to have like a name or an id attached to it but basically that's like the the main point so this gives like a user an ability to import this manifest uh, into their project uh, in an easy way to do it. Um, so uh, how it looks like then when you have it in the project? It looks like it's extremely similar to when you have like uh, standard files on your CGC. So as you can see here, this is like a project where you have like basically all the there's pointers and you have them like uh, uh, an ability to um, then uh, use them as inputs to your workflows and at the same time to use them as uh, uh, like um, the in that studio or uh, in the interactive analysis space. So for you as a user, those act as like standard file that you have on um, CGC, but there is like all this machinery behind that basically provides them as a, a there's a, um, you know, uh, uh, they are basically just your eyes. So um, what is important that I want to stress here is that while you have those as uh, as there, so you have uh, um, the file is not, not all the files are open, but you have also control files. So all the authorization is handled. So there's has this ability to have like a flexible authorization where you basically have like uh, the possibility to uh, have uh, either authentication uh, via authorization bearer token or via passport. That is the GH for GH passport uh, for authorization that Angela has basically has um, <clears throat> touched upon a little bit before, uh, which is like uh, a way that we have connected this standard to the 
DERS, uh, uh, sorry, the DERS standard to the GH for GH passport standard. And uh, in this case, in the CGC, you have the possibility to connect your account with the Kavatika in the, in the example with the Kavatika platform. And uh, this is done automatically uh, while you click connect and you have like basically you are logged into Kavatika, then you have the possibility to connect directly into that. And so what is important is like that you have uh, the ability to use uh, then the control data. So data that you have the authorization, this invokes all the authorization uh, stack days on the, the their server. So the control data can come from different ways and different modes. And you have like the possibility to still access them all in one go. So um, I would like to then just uh, uh, go to a summary of everything I said, and then uh, I'm happy to take any questions. So what is available today on the CGC is like uh, uh, the two main things, like the CGC acts as a third server, as we said, and is able to basically provide this uh, the data that is available there via classic DERS API. And that's like uh, something that everybody can use. But at the same time, uh, we have built uh, all the infrastructure from the DERS client point of view on the CGC, where you can then connect uh, uh, with the DERS client and then all the ancillary needs for the authorization, where you can connect, for example, here I'm showing like four different repositories with Kavatika, the Anvil, and the Biodata Catalyst. And you can get then and access all this data in one go on the CGC. Uh, so that's like, uh, this is uh, live today. And uh, basically it's, um, you have like lots and lots of different data available uh, to you as a researcher um, straight up thanks to the standards that basically doing their work. So um, that's my last slide. I would like to thank everybody that I've listened so far and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Michele. Thanks both um, Angela and Michele for this great talk. It was very illuminating for all of us. And uh, now I would like to open the floor to any questions for either Angela or Michele. Um, I'd just like to say, if you don't want to uh, ask the question, uh, you can also just type it in the chat. Anyways, it's okay. Maybe I could uh, ask a question of you, Michele. Um, I'm just wondering if um, CGC, uh, what maybe is on the roadmap in terms of future standards to be implemented there and how those might in, uh, involve the sort of the, the, the DERS workflow you presented. Yeah, so, um, so CGC today supports already WES uh, that I didn't talk about. Uh, so we have WES implementation that is available and uh, we also support uh, TERS directly in the West call. So those are basically live, so you can use them uh, straight up from the cloud. We are also working together with Russ to basically um, support the passport uh, directly when basically arise from there. So that's what we are uh, working on. We are working also with the SRA to do the integration with their, their server. Uh, so for all dbgap, uh, we are like uh, making inroads there. Um, I have some previews that, uh, like, uh, I would be excited to, to show, but <laughs> I don't think this is like, uh, not yet. <laughs> the, 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 the space is not, yeah, it's still, uh, it's still in the works, but we're working on that. So that, the standards that we are using there, of course, uh, and the CGC has like uh, lots of application of things like the north of 600 um, for working with uh, bioinformatics files, where basically, you know, BAM, CRAM, VCFs are all like uh, at home over there. And um, so, yeah, so those are basically the main uh, uh, standards that we are working on uh, at the moment. So that's great. It's just really nice to see um, one of these end to end implementation examples of GA for GH standards in, in the flesh. <laughs> yeah. And also, one thing I wanted to raise here that it was like the um, 
given this uh, ability to integrate with DERS uh, uh, servers, you can literally, if you have like, a, if you have a DERS open uh, server today, you can take the DERS URL, you can put it in the CGC, and that basically is usable straight up. It, it's it's on it's uh, it's straight. If instead your their servers as an authorization of some sort is still something that it's doable, uh, we are very happy to um, to to integrate uh, on that level. We have different type of integration, as I say, like you know the classic one is uh, via O2 via authentication bearer token, or we can go via um, passport if that's like uh, what uh, people are uh, working on, and um, and so basically, this is built to already to do that type of job. So, uh, for example, we are working um, on the CGC today to give like an idea. You can access all top metadata, all TCGA, TCIA, CGC data, all the kids first data, all the GTEx data, all the include data in all uh, and uh, you know several parts of the SRA they are open data. Uh, all in one project where basically for the user transparently they can run all the different analysis and the machine here below does all the job to basically do the right thing at the right moment to make everything work in a transparent way for the user. So that's basically what is extremely uh, interesting about that. And plus one more thing that I want to bring up uh, is that given the is now is de facto standard for sharing the data in genomics, proteomics, and so forth. Like when we have to integrate with the new nodes, the data of integrate, the time of integration is really diminished because we have like the possibility to, to jumpstart that in a very uh, quick way. I mean, things that before was taking maybe, you know, six months, half a year, now we can reduce it to like uh, two, three weeks. It's really, really fast. So. That of course means like faster data to researcher, faster way to integrate, like lots more uh, things over there. So, yeah. fantastic, thank you. Uh, go ahead, Deepti. Yeah, this my question is for Angela. Um, Angela, you mentioned a little bit about Beacon, and I've heard that in different contexts, and I wanted to, but I haven't got a, gotten a chance to read about it a little more. I was wondering if you can give a little synopsis of like what it does, what is involved in implementing it. Well, full disclosure, I am not an implementer. I'm not a software developer. I cannot tell you the ins and outs, the details of how to implement, um, but I can put you in the touch with the people who can. Um, so like I said, it's basically um, a, a, an API that you put on top of your data set to make it discoverable to the rest of the world. Um, so if you have data, you would implement Beacon on top of your data set. But then if you are a researcher who is looking for data, then you can go to um, the various uh, like Beacon network um, uh, URLs. I think beacon-network.org is one of them. And then there's also the Elixir Beacon Network. And then you can go into those. I can find some, some better URLs and, and, um, and share them perhaps in the chat if I get to it quickly enough. Um, and then you can go in there and just type in your query. And it's a little bit like a Google search where you're basically just saying, you know, do you have this data that I am interested in? Yes or no. But then, like I said, also there's much more sort of um, complex questions that you can answer at this point, um, depending on sort of uh, access levels of the data. Does that help? And um, perhaps you could give me your email in the chat and I could send you some more uh, more detailed information. Yeah, that, that was definitely um, helpful. I, I had heard this in the context of like, you know, if you don't want to make like a genomic data set available, you just want to do like a variant search. And it seemed like a very cool example, especially like if you have controlled access data and you only want to go through the trouble of getting access if the variant of interest is available. Um, exactly. Exactly. Right. You don't want to go through that all that trouble and then find out that like it's actually not at all of use to you. So, yeah, that's another huge benefit. So do you have to be part of a network for 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 somebody to be able to use this API? No, not at all. I mean, everything of GA for GH is completely open source. So the code is on online on GitHub, for one thing. Um, and obviously to query the network, you you can just anybody that has an access to the internet can can participate in that way. I see. 
Thank you so much. I, I'll again, like, I think I need to do reading on my part, but I'm I'm part of Michele's team, and we have the oh, okay. on our side. So I'll ask more implementation questions to Michele or, or somebody in your team. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I see there's another question in the chat. Yeah, there's another uh, question. So Should what is involved? Question. Oh, I'll read it, and then we'll figure okay. out who it's for. What is involved in begin in bringing data sets that are not yet part of NIH and CI GDC? There are multiple groups like Count Me In via Broad that are creating data sets with patient clinical germline and somatic sequencing. I'll let you take that, Michele. Yeah. So thank you very much, Guy, for the for the question. So um, with the Broad, we are uh, you know like uh, we are uh, one of our close collaborators. And uh, um, we are uh, figuring out how to get their data via the, the DIRT server. So what it means that the broad needs to stand up a DIRT server that is uh, accessible by uh, other type of people. And uh, for example, like, uh, you know, the CDC. Uh, and then you can basically plug this uh, DIRT um there's a URI directly on the CGC and then you have them on your project. If there is an authorization involved, we need to basically talk with the, with the broad to build like a, a path to it. And uh, that's like, there is a, on that, there is like a, a technical part, which is not super complicated. And then there is also like, a, maybe sometimes there's also like a legal part that needs to be verified. But uh, it's, um, the, the main machinery is there. So, we just need to make sure that uh, we can move this forward. If you are in a, in a position to, you know, to, to, to move this uh, forward, you have like a possibility to, you know, play a part, feel free to reach out and then we can see how we can, uh, um, you know, approach it and how we can go to it. Also, one thing that is very important for the CGC is like the CGC is multi-cloud. So we support uh, AWS and we support also GCP. So in case this, this data is on uh, GCP, uh, basically Google Cloud, we can simply like use them as directly from their space uh, without having the need to move it from uh, that data center to another one. And so avoiding all the egress and just using like Google facilities to operate on the data. Thank you, Michele. Uh, Guy, does that uh, answer your question, or do you have any additional follow-ups? Yeah, it, uh, it does. Do you can you hear me fine? Yes, we can uh, hear you. Sorry. Yes. Um, yeah, it does answer my question. I, I know that I'm involved with a few uh, patient advocate endeavors. You know, one via uh, the Broad, and also one via Yale and University of Colorado. And I and and these mechanisms. Uh, I'm familiar with similar types of initiatives that are going on in Arizona and in Southern California uh, and Washington University in St. Louis. And, and it seems like this is like a rinse and repeat kind of thing. We all have to work with uh, the GDC in, in some sort of fashion, but it's all kind of uh, more complicated than it needs to be. And, and when you guys just described this, I was like, wow, this makes so much more sense the normalization elements you know and, and the federated elements you know are right up you know the alleyway so you know the fact that you know nci gdc is part of this is surprising because they're really difficult to work with angela's smiling and quiet no comment <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, no, that's great, Guy. And I think um, one of the another area that GA for GH really needs to to do more work in is like you know connecting to the patient advocacy groups and the and uh, you know Count Me In is a great example. And I, I'd be happy to you know for you for you to reach out and we can sort of figure out how we might yeah. how we might work together. That'd be great. Okay, that sounds great. Yeah, and at the same time, we're also happy to you know look at your um, you know. Um, but what is the problem and then see if we can help somehow, you know, to solve it in some kind of way. So we are also very open to, to be rich. Well, well, and... well, I have an internal call this afternoon and, and I'll raise it as part of the subject and I'll get back to you guys later in the week. That's great. Super. 
Uh, Michele and Angela, any of you, if you're interested, you can leave your emails in the chat. Um, that might be easier for people to contact. Um, and any other questions? I know we are at time. Okay. Well, um, thank you once again, Angela and Michele. This was a great talk. It was very useful for us. And thanks everyone for joining and see you uh, next month for another webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Divya. Thank you, Michaela. Thank you, Angela. Bye-bye. <laughs>